So thank you to everyone for joining us. We'll be getting started in just a moment. For anybody who's not familiar with the Fellowship of Reconciliation, we are the oldest interfaith peace and justice organization in both the United States and the world. We formed in 1914 in Europe and 1915 in the US at that time to support conscientious objection to uh, World War I. And we have gone on since then uh, to continue to support peacemaking efforts and alternatives to war. We are a nonviolent, entirely pacifist organization. And we spent, uh, we were heavily involved in, re in the civil rights movement of in the United States, uh, working closely with uh, Dr. King, and we continue to do that work as well. And right now are devoting a lot of our energy to um, obtaining a ceasefire um, and a just and lasting peace in Israel and Palestine in these um, really difficult times. So I wanna, we have a really special guest today. And um, the reason we invited him today is because we are coming up on the anniversary of the brutal massacre um, by Hamas on October 7th. And so our guest today is Yonatan Ziegen, who's based in, in Tel Aviv. He grew up in Kibbutz Berry, I don't know if I pronounced that right, uh, holds a bachelor's degree in law and a master's degree in clinical social work, which is also my master's degree. Um, he has a unique blend of personal and professional experience. He um, is a father to school age children and he tragically lost his mother um, on October 7th. So I'd like to welcome Yonatan. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. And I'll just start by giving my my deepest condolences uh, on the loss of your mother as we come up on the one year you're at sight. Um, may her memory be for a blessing and for a revolution for peace. If uh, you could just start by telling us about her her work and um, who she was as a person and as a mother and a grandmother. <clears throat> um, well, she was born and raised in uh, Winnipeg, Canada. And uh, in a pretty traditional Jewish uh, North American family. And uh, when she was uh, in college, she had the opportunity to come to Israel for a year uh, to study in university. And then she realized that, um, that her connection to Judaism is not um, by religion, but uh, by, um, by culture and by... Uh, a national affiliation and that her future is going to be in Israel. So she went back to Canada. She finished school. She joined Habonim, a youth, a youth movement. Um, and together with a group of young idealists, she came to Israel in 74. Um, in a time where for her, and I think for a lot of her generation, Zionism and um, the term tikkun olam, don't know who in the room is familiar with, uh, wasn't uh, contradictory in their mind. And um, she immediately became involved at first uh, in uh, feminism, um, feminist activism. She was uh, one of the first uh, to head a kibbutz in the country, a woman. 
and, and she established the um, uh, the gender equality uh, department in the kibbutz movement and uh, also uh, got involved in the field of shared society fostering relationships with the neighbors in uh, Ramle um, and sitting on boards you know of the NIF and, uh, and other organizations and in 1990 uh, we moved to Kibbutz Be'eri which is right on the border with Gaza um, but those were the hopeful 90s and um, and she was able to continue her work uh, from a standpoint of hope and uh, she had she became a CEO of an organization and had projects in Gaza and uh, and in the West Bank but now I understand I remember that you asked about what kind of person she was <laughs> so um you know, for us, you know, for her family, for her two sons, she was always uh, just a wonderful, loving mother. Um, we didn't know her as an activist. We knew her as uh, a, a, a caring mother that read stories to us and was interested, uh, completely interested in everything we went through uh, in life. And... Um, and as a person, she I think she she had these interesting dualities of uh, on the one hand being very sensitive and um, and soft, sometimes fragile, um, and on the other hand very assertive, and um, and always in a position of leadership and uh, very straightforward with her ideals, um, which was, uh, I, I, I thought it was interesting and charming. <laughs> and, and I think that everything she did in her life um, was, a, was based in interpersonal relationships. And that's what led her work all uh, all the time. I see that uh, people are writing uh, interesting comments. Should we relate to them or? Uh... Well, let's let, let's stick with the um, program first, as is, and then we'll see when we get to questions. And I think we could have many hours, right, to discuss those topics and as well, um, you know, the climate right now in the United States, but um, I see the comments as well. Okay. And, I, and I ask that people uh, in the chat, I require not just ask that people be appropriate and be aware that no forms of hatred or bigotry will be allowed. So, sorry, back to, uh, your mother, but I'll move on to kind of an, a next question. One of the things that, and this might get a little bit into that that question, but uh, one of the things that I, I find that is really not known in the United States is um, the composition of the Southern Israel, I hear it referred to as the Gaza envelope, um, who lived there and what that population was and is. Um, the, the Gaza envelope was is a stretch of land um, and the, what is referred to as Israel proper uh, and the, the Israeli side of the Gaza border. Um, it's uh, mainly uh, composed of small kibbutzim, which, is, which are... Um, a communities with a pretty specific uh, lifestyle that we can get into if it's, in, it's interesting to someone. Uh, most of them were um, uh, in the 
they were um, like uh, liberal, uh, not liberal, labor Zionists, what they call, like the, the Zionist left in Israel. Um, I myself wouldn't, uh, don't define myself in, as part of that uh, camp, but uh, that was the majority of the, the people. They voted for the Labour Party, um, mostly, and the uh, agricultural communities. Um, yeah. So I understand that uh, your mother and, and many others um, in the kibbutzes um were involved had relationships with the Palestinians in Gaza especially around medical care uh, if you could talk a bit about uh, your mother's involvement that way well um as I said after we moved there in the 90s uh, she became familiar with uh, people in Gaza um back then it wasn't sealed uh, Gaza wasn't uh, in a closure like we like it has been for so many years, um, and in some point she became a CEO of an organization called the Negev Institute for Strategies of Peace and Development, and um, they had uh, uh, projects. Um, together with uh, Palestinians in Gaza for um, civil society training and leadership training and economical uh, uh, projects, joint projects and encounter groups and uh, things like that. I myself remember uh, going there on a visit which was highly unusual for, uh, you know, no, no, none of my peers got the chance to to visit uh, Gaza. And um, I did that in uh, 2000, just before the second intifada broke, going and visiting friends of hers and colleagues of hers. Um, after the second intifada, the, the closures became more... Um, what's the word for it? More... Um, more effective in terms of uh, closing some uh, place down. And it uh, slowly became what we started to uh, uh, relate to as uh, the biggest open air prison in the world. Um, and then in 2007, when uh, Hamas uh, got into power, then it was uh, totally... Um, differentiated from, I mean, uh, when her colleagues couldn't, remained in Gaza up until 2007, and then uh, they fled because they weren't on the right side of the political map, uh, the Palestinian political map in Gaza. Um, but she continued uh, in her organization, she continued working with uh, the Bedouin community in, uh, in Israel, and also in other organizations like Other Voice and um, uh, and All Map and a lot of organizations that tried to continue a cross border work and uh, peace building between Israel and uh, Israelis and uh, Gazans. Um, in two thousand fourteen, she retired from um, running the organization and uh, became very much involved in um, women wage peace and in an uh, organization that you referred to before road to recovery which was volunteering to drive palestinian patients from gaza to israeli hospitals patients that couldn't receive a, a sufficient health care in Gaza because they had more complex uh, illnesses so they they would drive uh, them to Israeli hospitals um, so 
so um, I have family in, in Israel. I, I assume they likely voted, did or continue to vote labor, but definitely consider on themselves within that. And uh, I remember a year of, of visiting them uh, before I was um, later later deported and banned from Israel, but I was visiting them one year and uh, speaking to them, uh, tr trying to broach politics with them and uh, talking with them. And, and I brought up uh, Gaza and children in Gaza and their position. And like I said, I would consider them liberal. I, they consider themselves liberal. Um, their a position, their opinion to me that they communicated to me was that there are no moderates in Gaza. That uh, even children there um, can't be trusted to uh, want peace, and so shouldn't be. You know, the conversation didn't go on too long. But I'm wondering how your mother, I, I assume, uh, dealt with that kind of position, not from the far right, but from more moderate or middle, um, if she had experiences with that and, and her take that way. Yeah, uh, it's a tragic uh, misconception in um, in Israel that is a that is a pretty much across the political uh, spectrum um, and um, it relates to what I said before uh, about like in the past people could identify themselves as a Zionist and still believe in peace and uh, in uh, justice and uh, stuff like that. But it's changed during the years when the Israeli uh, uh, government uh, and, um, and then the public opinion went far to the right. And, um, and when you go, you know, when the mainstream is more to the right than even what you uh, considered once left becomes more uh, right as well. Um, she paid prices in her own community because she stayed in her position. She didn't uh, shift or... Uh, um, and she knew, you know, she knew for a fact what kind of people live in Gaza because she had colleagues and friends there and people who uh, cooperated with her in uh, in uh, trying to um, to create a new reality in, uh, in Israel and Palestine. Uh, so she always stayed centered and, um, and I think proud of, uh, of her convictions um, but she paid prices for it in in her community and um, and also as a as a citizen. Um, but also, you know, when as we know, when people are proud, when they stand their ground, they usually um, have impact on uh, on others. So in Berry. Whatever uh, uh, she when whatever she got involved uh, in, you could see after a while a group of people joining. Um, which was nice, but it represented, you know, the 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 general statistics. So you had like a a, a very small uh, group of people that are uh, involved in. Um, peace initiatives and uh, the vast majority or the majority is indifferent and uh, and a lot of people are opposed and uh, and hostile to that. So if you could talk about October 7th um, from your from from your experience, how it happened for you. 
Um, it was the holiday and I was uh, supposed to be there with my family and um, we arbitrarily decided not to go. You know, one of the first times we decided not to spend the holiday in the, in the kibbutz. Um, so I woke up in my house really early in the morning, around 6.30 or 7, to the sound of alarms. And I um, I didn't pay it much attention. I, uh, I, I'm accustomed to, to alarms in Israel, so I tried to continue sleeping. But every few uh, minutes, it, it became clearer and clearer that this is really something unusual. And that there's a uh, incursion, like uh, that never happened. You know, um, it did happen fifty years ago in uh, the Yom Kippur War, um, but I didn't have the uh, the context for it, and um, I started communicating with uh, Vivian, and uh, I was with her on the phone and uh, in texts through the morning. Um, and it was, um, it's something that you, you experience something without uh, really internalizing what is happening because it's so unimaginable. And it was unimaginable because for one, you grow up in Israel with the notion that there is a strong army. And on October 7th, it uh, there wasn't. They just weren't there. And uh, so when we communicated, we I thought, you know, okay, something really unusual is happening, but it's going to be over in a minute, in another minute, in another minute. And it wasn't over. The kibbutz was overrun um, uh, by Hamas uh, fighters, and uh, they held on for three days in the kibbutz. But for um, for my mother, it uh, it was pretty short because she was killed uh, at eleven a.m. on Saturday, on October seventh. So in the beginning, we stayed pretty, you know, we tried to stay cool. We continued joking around and just uh, trying to collect information because she was in her house hiding and um, she couldn't really understand the scope of, um, of the attack and, uh, and nobody could. Um, but in so at some point, I talked to her on the phone and I heard over the line, I heard really loud gunshots and uh, yelling in Arabic outside of a window. And then I realized that uh, that it it's not going anywhere. Uh, it's not resolving itself. And... Um, and we said goodbye. We we parted. I asked her, "What do you want to continue speaking till the end, or should we?" And uh, so I told her, "You know, we parted. You you had a full life. You can go feeling of fulfillment, and I love you." And um, said goodbye. And uh, after. Uh, after a few minutes, she wrote me that they're inside the house. And um, that was that for her. Um, at first, I was sure she was killed. and um, But after a while, hearing about others that I knew for sure that was de that were dead and not hearing anything formal about her and understanding that people are being taken uh, into Gaza. 
So we started to um, believe that she was a hostage. And uh, she was considered by the, by the government a hostage for 38 days um, until they were able to find her remains in her house just after 38 days uh, because it was completely burnt down. Um, yeah. We'll just take a moment, everybody, just to um, take that in. Okay. Um, I'm so sorry. What was it like in the aftermath of October 7th? Um, and it, at this time, you were one of the hostage families, um, believing that she was. Uh, what was it like to witness um, the resulting war, the actions of Israel in, in response? And what were your thoughts in those immediate days or weeks? Um, for me, it was, uh, I had the wishful thinking that, um, that this event of October 7th would be a turning point in the sense that uh, Israel will realize that uh, no use of force is, um, will bring us security and that no wall is high enough and no weapon is sophisticated enough and um, and that we will, uh, uh, you know, gain control on the, on the border and then stop and immediately start to uh, diplomatically uh, reach a, a, a deal for the hostages, go, to the Palestinian Authority, go to Saudi Arabia, go to uh, um, uh, to the United States, and uh, and say, okay, we understood, we we get it now, and that's what we're willing to do in order for the Palestinians to be uh, uh, liberated, and that's what we're willing to do for in order for the conflict and the occupation to end. And uh, and then they could have asked, you know, they could have asked for the for Hamas not, uh, you know, to to step uh, out of the of the picture, and I and I I'm pretty sure they would have gotten that. So that was that was that were my sentiments right, you know, on October eighth. But as I said, that was wishful thinking, and, and we entered. Um, just a uh, atrocious uh, war uh, that doesn't end. It's been a year. And we're not gaining anything in terms of our ability to grow out of it. And we are just uh, wiping out any uh, remains of morality that we had as a people. Um, and we're just feeding, feeding more fundamentalism in a, in the region, and, um, and and just prolonging this uh, catastrophic way of life of uh, what Israelis always call living on the sword. Um yeah, that will that will make feelings towards the world. Yeah. So I know that you have made a work transition uh since the passing of your mother. Um from I think you were doing clinical social work. Um from that to taking on uh, your mother's legacy and her work. If you could talk about that decision, um, 
what that work looks like now and 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 as well i, I said my uh, my master's degree is in social work as well and i, I don't think these things uh are um contradictory to each other. In fact, I think they're blended uh, work for peace and uh, social work. So if you could talk about uh, thoughts you might have in that uh, frame as well. Um, well, yeah, I was a social worker. Uh, I always had, you know, I didn't, October 7th didn't change my mind in terms of my uh, political views or the way I analyzed the world, but it made me um, feel the urgency and the responsibility to be invested in change because being a, a social worker, which is very meaningful, and it did a lot of good for for uh, for for specific people, but in in Israel and Palestine, when you you know, I, it doesn't matter how much I helped one family or one uh, person when the system itself is broken, and where life itself isn't sustainable. And um, I uh, I couldn't go. It was a before and after effect that I couldn't get myself, you know, back to just living life uh, and not trying to impact or shape our future here in order for a life to to be able to to flourish here because it can't as long as the conflict. Uh, uh, continues it can't it can't develop really um so i quit my job um and um at first i it, during the days where she was con when she was considered hostage i um i spoke a lot um uh, and i started to feel that you know, there's a power in, a, you know, in expressing your voice. And after she was identified, um, I felt a responsibility in utilizing this new sad status of, of bereavement. Um, that, yeah, sadly grants people a, a kind of moral authority to speak about uh, our reality here because of the prices we pay. Uh, so I felt responsibility in, um, in uh, utilizing that and I became uh, just invested and active in, uh, in uh, peace initiatives, in the parent circle, Bereaved Family Forum, which is a joint Israeli-Palestinian organization of bereaved families, um, lobbying in the international community for um, for pressuring them to pressure us because you have such a crucial role. You had a crucial role in the status quo, and now you have a crucial role in uh, in in changing it. Um, and cooperating. Uh, <laughs> Please go on. Um, uh, and cooperating with other uh, activists and, and other organizations in trying to mobilizing and re-energizing the left in Israel and the peace camp. Because there's a sense now, there's a feeling that Although we are pretty uh, small in number, we got a surge of energy. There's a stronger energy, a, a more, uh, um, I don't know, a more assertive uh, attitude towards the uh, change. We uh, moving a little bit into into that and and kind of the politics of today. I'm going to incorporate uh, one of the questions that I saw in the chat, 
Um, so uh, I'll, I'll begin just with um, the, the recent execution of, of the six hostages. And that was very impactful for Americans uh, because I think because uh, at the Democratic National Convention, we had met the Goldberg Bolins. And when you meet somebody, whether, you know, through the television, I happen to be there in person, but it affects you differently. And so that um, had a really strong effect. And, and we've, I've been watching um, what's been happening in Israel since with the protests. And so in incorporating one of the, the questions that I've seen, um, the person was asking, are the protests that are taking place uh, for, for a hostage deal, um, are they only concerned with their one hostages or is there concern for uh, the tens and tens of thousands of Palestinian lives um, lost as well? And if you could also, um, if you wanna talk about what that experience of, of finding out about that execution um, of the hostages uh, was like for you personally as well. Um, sadly, I I think that uh, we can't generalize, but the majority of the protesters in Israel uh, aren't, um, they don't see the clear link between uh, dehumanizing the Palestinians and uh, and the fact that there are atrocities that are being uh, committed on both sides. Um, and um, yeah, I find myself, it's hard for me to, to join I do go to the streets, but it's hard for me to 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 join most of the protests because they aren't calling enough for the end of the war and uh, and uh, of and for the end of the occupation and the conflict, and more so for bringing the hostages home. And the hostages would have come back if we would end the war. So when, they, when the protests are relating to only the, the, the Israeli side of the situation, they are not, uh, they're not morally uh, correct and they're not effective in my mind. Um, and you know it's 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 hard for me to say it because there's a there's a very strong energy when hundreds of thousands of people are in the streets. But um, but as long as we don't treat the actual problem, which is occupation and the conflict, and we treat the symptoms that are security, that are the hostages, we treat that as the problem then we don't, then we th then we can't solve anything because you can't you can't solve a symptom without uh, without relating to the problem itself are you hopeful that a deal may be reached um to release the hostages the remaining i believe 101 it depends how you define hope, because do I think it's possible? Yes, it was possible from the beginning. It was possible to not start the war and receive most of the hostages back uh, and, and starting a new holistic diplomatic process. Um, do I think that if we just make the international community be more uh, assertive then we can see a, a deal and a change and there's a yes. If I'm looking at just our reality in Israel, where our leadership, which is not really the right term from the, for them because they're only politicians, they're not leaders. But as long as our politicians 
uh, are uh, driven by self-interest and um, and from the their longing for chaos and um, and the dominance then no we won't see a deal because it's in the hands of our government and the minute we will say that the war is over and we are willing to uh, promise uh, this and that to Hamas in order for uh, the hostages to return, then, then, then they will return. But um, I'm, mo I'm, I'm more hopeful uh, for the future, for a change in, in the future in our lifetimes in terms of our ability to uh, to reach peace than I am for the hostages to return alive. That might make you more hopeful than me. And so I, I want to, to ask you to <laughs> expand on that. What gives you that hope? And, and, and I'll say that I sometimes, since October 7th and the war, I, I feel so much, I think, how will we ever find reconciliation? And um, so please, um, what gives you hope? Well, there's, there's a few layers uh, to it, but um, I touched upon it before in saying that when something seems possible, when it's realistic, then you can build hope on it. And I think that it's very, very simple uh, to end the conflict. It's just what we're missing is will. We just don't want to. <laughs> but when something is technically simple and uh and uh, and what is missing is just the the your um, um uh, the will to do it then you can say okay i can i can change a few blocks in this building in order for it to to stand uh, to to stand uh, and it makes me hopeful because uh, because i think it's simple and possible um another thing is history you know these kinds of catastrophes create movement in nations in peoples uh, in status quo in uh, and so there is movement now we don't know where it will land but in the hopes it won't lead to extermination it will lead to a positive for a more positive uh, uh, outcome than it was before and you see it all the time there are conflicts in the world and there are resolution of conflicts in the world who would imagine uh, you know france and germany in general europe you know being uh, this uh, confederation and um uh, or south africa northern ireland rwanda it's it's you know people resolve conflicts as much as they go into conflicts so we kind of exhausted i i i think we we're in the in the phase of exhaustion of our conflict and uh and the next phase will be to resolve it Alibi from your mouth to, to <laughs> God's ears and, and to the politicians' actions. Yeah, to the administration's <laughs> ears. I mean, that's 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 we that's a necessity. A necessity is the international community intervention because we have a blind spot in Israel. As I said before, we 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 don't um, we don't see. Um, the the actual problem. We treat security in Israel. We treat security is as the problem where it is just a symptom. And uh, we can't do an internal process of change if nobody is signaling to us that there is a problem that needs to be fixed. And signaling means conditioning aid it means sanctions it means incentives 
uh, when you do the right things or, uh, or you know, creating a new anchor in the political sphere of, uh, of uh, political imagination, of a prospect to the future. Listen, if we just do that, this is how it will look like. And that can give Israelis uh, and Palestinian political actors something to hold on to and give to their uh, electorate and say, listen, there's a package. Here is the package. This is what we'll gain if we do that. And this is what we lose if we continue this. And, you know, it's not just stopping to stop to be a passive uh, bystander. The international community is actively supporting the conflict by not conditioning aid, by not investing in, a, in, a, in peace building, by a continuing diplomatic relations with no, uh, with no uh, repercussions. That is actively uh, uh, enabling the, the conflict and that has to stop in order for us to, 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 to be able to, to start an internal process in, in each of our society and, and together for a shared future. If, uh, if you've been following um, the protests and the movements in the United States, uh, specifically, I'm going to contain that to the United States because the United States, we are so uh, involved in maintaining the conflict. Um, what are your thoughts on, on what you see happening in the U.S. And, and any advice for us here in the U.S. on, on how we can be um, most effective? I'm not sure I have advice. I have a request. Please, that that's <laughs> uh, when you know when we here on the ground look outside to the world to North America, and when I say we, I mean myself as Israeli Jewish and my uh, colleagues, Palestinian colleagues, and we look at the rhetoric and the and the demonstrations and the, the this polarization for to pro-Palestine or pro-Israel and feel that it's just un, a constructive or unproductive or, you know, the term you as There needs to be an interfaith effort to rally for peace because it doesn't matter how strong you make an argument for Palestinian victimhood. You will be right. But Palestinians will all be, only be liberated if we achieve a peace, if we achieve an agreement. There won't be a mass decolonization of Israel where no Jews are left here. And and when I and and in talking to uh, Jews, there there will not be a massive. Uh, a deportation or a, or a displacement of Palestinians that, you know, there's 7 million Palestinians, 7 million Jews, we are not going anywhere. The, our only ability for Israelis to be secure, for Palestinians to be liberated, for anybody between the river and the sea to have equal rights of self-determination, of human rights, you know, basic human rights, that the Palestinians don't enjoy. The only way to achieve that is by working together for a shared future. And it will entail, you know, in the, in the end, it will entail a, a, a compensation. It will entail acknowledgement of the power dynamic. But in order to get to that point, we need to to be able to work together uh, to envision, to envision a shared future where the, the two peoples uh, share this land. Um, so when I look at, uh, at North America, I get the feeling that they are importing our conflict instead of exporting solutions to us. 
and and when you see young people ideological people who are not paying the price who are not living here and and uh, and and understanding what it means to to continue a, a violent resistance to to continue oppression uh, I'm talking about both sides and 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 for them to to call on us to to uh, on, on, on each side to continue being strong for the Israelis or to continue to resist for the Palestinians uh, violent resistance instead of marching together in a rally for peace with both flags it's just it's terrible in my mind so I think we get right at that first question here and uh, I'll first say thank you. You articulated what I say so often after when this uh, particular war broke out. I, I have been saying since the start of that that it's it's like a football team. People choose a side and then they're cheering for their team and I'm like, this isn't a football game. It's just life and death. Um and so one of the things that that has taken place here in the United States, uh, which I've watched and and speak out on, on a bit as well, is um, the framing of the word Zionist. And uh, I'm very critical of Zionism, and I think it's very important to have conversations and analysis and debate and discussion and critique. Uh, but it has become a... a a word that's used as a slur in some ways here in the United States. And that so that if somebody identifies as Zionist rather than uh, discovering what that means for them, because I would argue that Zionism or to be a Zionist is far more complex than uh, it was to say be a Confederate um, in pre-Civil uh, War here in the United States or uh, far different than far more complex than uh, just to declare somebody a racist. Um, so if you could talk about, so we get back to that first and very early question uh, where somebody asked, how could you, how, wasn't it contradictory to be a Zionist and to be pro-peace? And if you could talk about uh, that, that, that challenging topic for, for us these days. Um, yes, now I think we can say um, theoretically that it is contradictory. But Zionism as a term, as a as a way of life, as a I don't know, um, it developed uh, for a hundred years, for more than a hundred years, and in the beginning. For Europeans, for European Jews who were horrendously uh, persecuted in Europe, for them to uh, create the Zionist movement um, was uh, it was a freedom movement, and um, only short after, shortly after, it became a displacement uh, uh, enterprise, but. The base of it is um, it it came to answer an existential uh, threat of an entire uh, nation, an entire people. Uh, I wish they would have gone somewhere else. I wish they would have been welcomed somewhere else. Um, I. Since I was a teenager, I didn't uh, define myself as Zionist because I didn't believe in the right of the Jewish uh, people to settle uh, specifically in the land of Israel because of the uh, because of the promised land, and they there were people here. But we need to remember that. Zionism wasn't just, it wasn't a consensus, it was a movement and it has it had streams in it. So there were a lot of people and they were strong, uh, uh, impactful uh, sects of Zionism who thought we would come to Israel and we will get a peace. We will get something of our own in order to escape persecution. 
they didn't prevail and it became uh it became a displacement project it became creating uh a, a, a state uh, for a nation state for a certain people instead of a different people instead of the native uh, uh, people who were there and that's a that's that's an original sin right and we see that all over the world Americans originated for, from an original sin of the Native American genocide and they actually have two you know slavery as well um we have colonialism that changed the face of the planet and and created a uh, shifts in nations and peoples and the uh, and uh the, so yes it happened and it was an original sin do do you ask me if we could have gone a different way if zionism could have stayed uh, uh after establishing the state of israel in 48 could have be you know have a, a like a winner's a hum, humble a, i don't know and 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 then turn to equity and turn to a, a, a justice and and create a viable uh, palestine or allow enable a viable palestinian state alongside it and then the, the 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 original sin would be a stain of the past it would be it would have been a, a scar but now it's a bleeding wound and we are not doing anything in order to heal that wound the opposite we are for many many years since 67 absolutely before that it was a question but we are deepening the wound we are expanding the, the atrocities we are and then it became you know contradictory to to a uh, to be a zionist and to um uh, and to seek peace but uh but it's yeah i don't know well I, I will uh, say and thank, because I know some of them are on this call, it was some FOR members that um, inspired and taught me to be less black and white thinking on that and uh, to to think about how we build a larger tent rather than shut people out. Yeah, I want to relate to that, to that yeah, remark please. because because for someone to identify themselves as Zionist, they are not a, a, they are not thinking in the way that I constructed now. They are still holding some of them, right? Some of them that you meet in the in North America, they are not bad people. They they are holding in their minds the the old version that they their wishful thinking of of the ability to use it. So if you create a dialogue instead of erasing only because of the, uh, of the, um, of the world itself, then you, can, then you can investigate if this is a person who believes in a Jewish supremacy or is this a person who just, you know, when he says uh, Zionism, he means something that you can live with, and it's just a, a misunderstanding of terms, you know. Uh, so it's dangerous. That's I think that's a problem in American discourse in general for for a long time now, the inability to to uh, to stay in in complexity to 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 talk to someone. Uh, um, and mutually investigate what we mean when we talk and what we and, and what what we actually stand for as opposed to what we raise our banners for and um yeah so as we come at the end um 
And I know there have been a lot of questions in the chat and we will save the chat and we will pass it on to you, uh, Jonathan, in case there are some that you want to address. And I'm also happy to um, address uh, questions from the chat. And uh, I think folks know my email, but it's my name, Ariel Gold at forusa.org. Um, so as, as we come to a close, I want to uh, first thank our uh, combatants for peace who, who co-sponsored this conversation and who I know you work with, Jonathan, um, and as well, Americans for Peace Now, and if not now, for helping uh, promote and uh, this conversation. Um, we're going to put in the chat again the link to make donations, and we'll also send this out in an email uh, in honor and memory of Vivian Silver and to carry on her work through Yonatan and everybody that he works with. Uh, and well, so the contribution is specifically for a prize. It's not going to oh. uh, pay my salary. It's a... It's a prize that we established. I, I don't remember if, if we talked about it. No, it's we a... didn't. Please, ah. let's let's talk about that. And so... if I can add into that, I'll say that uh, what made me reach out to you, what specifically inspired me to really want to have this conversation is I saw that you had put on social media or somebody had um, a banner uh, about honoring your mother, not through the state of Israel, but uh, for feeding people in Gaza. So if you could... Yeah, tell us yeah, a bit about that. Was, that was a project uh, of an old, a humanitarian organization called Clean Shelter, and they uh, opened a, a, a shelter in a, in a refugee camp in Gaza, and they named it after uh, Vivian, and I was really honored that they, they got my blessing, but the credit goes to Clean Shelter, an organization. Um, in terms of the prize, we established a, a, a prize fund in order to annually grant uh, two women winners every year, a Jewish woman and a Palestinian woman uh, that work in the fields of shared society, cross-border peace building, and the promotion of women to uh, leadership positions. Uh, so it will be uh, each year a ceremony and uh, $15,000 each to each winner. And uh, we hope to develop a alumni network and uh, to see where it goes. Uh, so if you go into the link and contribute, it will go uh, directly into that prize fund. Thank you. And uh, we at Fellowship of Reconciliation will make a donation as well honored to uh, be a part of that and we will follow along uh, when those awards are given. I want to thank you so much for joining us and for giving me and I imagine so many on this in this conversation um, real hope in a time that it is so needed. And can we actually ask questions, Ariel, or we're just listening? I'm just curious. I don't know what the format is. Oh, we're, we're just, yes, we're just at the end now, and we were, uh, you can send questions in, and we will pass them around. Of course, yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, Yonatan, and um, many blessings on, on your work, and um, may your mother's memory be for a blessing. Thank you. Thank you very much.